Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nadia Lali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. I'm also professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, which is part of a series, a lecture series on querying the Middle East and its diasporas. The lecture series is supported by the Herbert H. Goldberger Lectureship Fund and co-sponsored by the LGBTQIA and plus thinking initiative, as well as Pembroke, the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. And today I'm happy to welcome Sima Shahzari. Professor Sima Shahzari is an associate professor in the Department of Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Sima. They are interested in transnational feminist theory, transnational sexuality studies, non Eurocentric queer and transgender studies, Middle East studies, empire militarism neoliberal governmentality, biopolitics, digital media, refugees, diasporas, and political anthropology. Aside from their academic work, Dr. Shahzari has a long history of activism at queer and women's organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area. Their book, Politics of Rightful Killing, which I just have here and read recently, and it's really brilliant. So that's Politics of Rightful Killing, Civil Society, Gender and Sexuality in Blogistan was published by Duke University Press in 2020. And it, the book provides an analysis of Blogistan as a site of cyber governmentality where simultaneously national and neoliberal gendered subjectivities are produced through online and offline heteronormative disciplining and normalizing techniques and where the concept of loaned life is subjected to a pending death in the name of rights. Now, Dr. Shahzari is currently working on their second book, manuscript tentatively titled Moving Queers and Queer Moves, Deterritorialization De and Loaned Life. The project combines ethnographic research among Iranian queer and transgender refugees and refugee rights organizations with the analysis of queer diasporic literature, films, theater, and activist organizations to extend the concept of loaned life. So um, I hope we might get uh, to this uh, Sima. Um, now, just uh, before I'm going to start the conversation with you, I'd like to just say something about the structure of today's event. Sima and I will be in conversation uh, for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. If you have a question or comment, please put that in the Q&A function and I'll monitor that. So Sima, welcome. Really uh, wonderful uh, to have you with us today. Um, now, before asking you more specific questions about your book, uh, The Politics of Rightful Killing, um, and also recently in an, an article that you're working on or ideas that you're sort of working on, uh, which um, I think you, with this working title of Queer States, uh, Geopolitics and Queer Anthropology, I was wondering if you could tell us um, a little bit about your research trajectory. So what have you been working on and how did you get interested in the kinds of work that you do? Thank you so much, Nadia, for um, having me and uh, for uh, reading the book and introducing the book. I really appreciate that. And um, many thanks to Barbara and Alex for all the behind the scenes work that um, you have been doing. Um, so uh, yes, as you said, you know, the title of this talk is Queer State, and that is um, something that I just recently wrote and, um, you know, ha have been basically uh, trying to think about. Um, and I wrote it because I was asked to write uh, a, a chapter for the book that uh, Margot Weiss is um, editing called uh, Queer Anthropology. So uh, it was, uh, you know, the intention was to write about queer anthropology of the state. So 
I thought since this is something that I have been thinking about and writing about recently, I, uh, you know, I could talk about that. But of course, we can also um, talk about the book because they're quite related to each other. Uh, in terms of my research trajectory, um, for decades, I've been interested in the politics of uh, the Iranian uh, diaspora and uh, in relationship to gender and sexuality. And, um, uh, you know, whether it's my activist work or academic work, um, I've been very much, you know, um, thinking about how gender and sexuality are articulated in um, Iranian diasporic formations uh, and the kinds of politics uh, towards the so-called homeland. Um, so I, uh, you know, for uh, when I was a grad student, of course, I um, worked on um, uh, or intended to actually think about queerness among Iranian diaspora and started um, blogging. And that was, you know, in the early 2000s when uh, soon after, uh, you know, the September 11, 2001, um, Persian blogging became uh, a thing. It, uh, there were more than 100,000 Persian blogs. Um, and there was this hype about um, blogging, setting Iranians free and so on and so forth. So um, I was actually, uh, you know, shifting my research from thinking about the satellite television pro programs that uh, were produced in Los Angeles and broadcast to Iran um, to the world of Persian blogging, because uh, there, there were a lot of, like I said, um, you know, there was a hype and a lot of news reports about um, Persian blogging. And from there, as I was doing my research and focusing on gender and sexuality, I saw that it's, you know, quite related to um, the politics of democratization when it comes to the participation of the Iranian diaspora um, in the freedom projects. Uh, so, it became really kind of a political anthropology kind of research. And um, I, I uh, continued that thread and wrote about the US democratization projects, which is something that I talk about in the book and we can talk about that later. So, um, and of course, you know, towards the end of uh, my uh, dissertation, uh, there was an incident that uh, made me Kind of think about the project that I'm working on now and have been writing about actually for almost a decade now, um, and that is uh, Iranian queer refugees. When I was in uh, Toronto, where I was doing part of my field work, um, uh, an Iranian trans woman um, committed suicide, and uh, to me it was it really affected me in a way that. Um, her story, which had become so public, uh, publicized in all these uh, films about uh, trans Iranians and their suffering, no one talked about her death in Toronto, uh, as if it didn't fit that story of fleeing the home of oppression, i.e. Iran, to coming to the so-called free world Canada. So that is how I became interested in the politics of death, um, queer death, queer and trans death. And um, so I, I have done field work in Turkey among Iranian queer and trans refugee applicants in Turkey and how they uh, their lives become disposable in the name of protection of their rights um, or in the name of refugee rights. So that's kind of the trajectory. And of course, thinking about um, both of these projects, whether it was weblogist on the Iranian blogosphere or queer and trans refugees, often uh, there is this kind of obsession with the state. Um, state becomes the sole um, force or, you know, uh, the, the entity that uh, the assumption is that state is the, uh, or state has monopoly over violence. And I've been uh, thinking beyond that, thinking about the art of government, in civil society, and that is through NGOs, through you know the human rights uh, regimes, refugee regimes, um, 
the so-called liberating states and Iranian diaspora who participate in um, the kind of normalization of the Iranian population um, at large. So that is, I don't know if that responds mm -hmm. to your question, but that's kind of the tragic. Yeah, issue. yeah, no, thank you. I mean, of course you do, um, you know, very different work from kind of research that I've been involved with, but what sort of resonates a lot is that, I mean, I, I can imagine just as I was not able working on Iraq uh, to not pay attention to the, you know, political developments, I mean, you know, sanctions, war, conflict, occupation, and I um, can only imagine that, of course, these issues have influence and I mean you're writing about it as well in your book I mean there is uh, you know 9-11 but then there are all the sort of Iran specific uh, issues uh, both in the context of what's happening within Iran but also U.S. Iranian relations um, so maybe we can come back to some of these issues later on I'm just sort of you know thinking because um, as I mentioned initially and you know so this event is part of a lecture series on on querying the Middle East, and one of the one of the issues that I've been trying to speak, sort of address with you know all my guests is this idea of what queer studies actually means in the context of Middle East studies, because I mean I think one of the so I mean I'm I'm not an expert, but from what I'm I understand, and I'm I'm sort of trying to this year uh, teach a course on querying migration and diasporas. Um, well, actually, it's gendering migration diasporas, but a queer lens is an important aspect. But what I find is that, you know, much of the literature in terms of queer theory and even queer of color critique tends to be quite US centric. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm sort of interested to know from you, you know, what does a queer anthropology entail in your view? And how can we queer Middle East studies and how can we decenter the US mm -hmm. in terms of queer studies? Well, that's a good point. And um, I think this is something that um, uh, several people now have been working on and writing about. Um, you know, Shirin Sekali and some other people did special uh, issue on uh, queering Middle East and then uh, a GLQ, again, lesbian quarterly. Um, issue that was uh, edited by uh, Angelia Rondekar and uh, Gita Patel focused on geopolitics. And part of that was to think about how queer theory has uh, very much become the turf of the US kind of theorization, right? So uh, when you think about queer theory, people often in these annual meetings go to American studies. So <laughs> American studies has become the home for queer theory. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, the disciplinary divide and um, the way that Middle East studies or area studies in general uh, in the eye of uh, queer theory are seen as kind of very much bound to the nation state, identity bound, and therefore not queer or not queer enough. Um, so whatever that comes from, uh, Middle East studies or, uh, you know, from the elsewhere is not considered to be queer theory as Gita Patel and uh, Angelia Rondekar argue and uh, Jasper Kaur and Maya McDoshi also have um, an um, article in that issue where they talk about this, that um, queer theory, despite its claims to move beyond the fixed notions of sexual identity, still very much uh, centers sexuality. Um, in the way that recenters uh, the kind of formations in the US, the, uh, you know, the human sexuality form in the US, and then kind of, you know, um, uh, assumes that the rest of the world has to match those definitions and those ways of thinking about uh, life, death, sexuality, and so on and so forth. So um, you're right, I think, in, uh, um, saying that uh, much of the queer theory, even queer of color uh, theory, very much focuses on the US. And of course, queer of color theory is thinking about racial formations and the exclusions uh, of queer theory in the US context and uh, the way that sexuality has been um, 
the kind of uh, the focal point in the racial uh, exclusions and there is you know that is of course very important um, and uh, you know that seminal work uh, of course needs to be taught in um, the classrooms not just in the US but elsewhere but when we think about queering Middle East or queering Middle East studies I think the assumption is that Middle East is not queer and therefore we have to queer it or you know excavate some kind of queerness in our past history or this and that and I think rather than that we can think about queerness otherwise and the way that in queer states for example um, I've been thinking about that or talking about that has been um, through um, this kind of lens of not thinking of queerness as necessarily attached to sexual injury or sexual identities. Um, and that is, uh, you know, uh, Kathy Cohen, of course, thinking about a queer color critique in the 90s um, said that queer theory, despite its claims of moving beyond fixed notions of sexual identity uh, by focusing on particular forms of, you know, queerness is recentering sexual identities. And rather than that, um, Kathy Cohen uh, suggested that we can think about shared struggle. So, you know, when she's talking about uh, the welfare queen and, uh, you know, bull dagger and thinking about how um, uh, it is uh, it, these forms of exclusion that, of course, have to do with sexuality, but are not necessarily about queer as an identity would be a way to think about queer theory. And then, you know, if we think about that in the context of the Middle East, you know, some people have been doing that work, uh, Hassan Musavi's recent work, recent book, or, you know, Jasper Poir and many other people who have been thinking about um, queerness beyond the kind of uh, Euro-American epistemological traditions and thinking about forms of exclusion. And, you know, that is how I'm thinking about thinking about queerness in the Middle East, not as necessarily sexual identities that have histories in the US and trying to kind of use the US as a yardstick against which other places are measured, but as thinking otherwise. And I have to mention here, I wrote uh, an article that came out in Arab Studies Journal um, a year ago or so, and that is um, thinking about queerness through Fatima Marnisi's dreams of trespass. I mean, if you think about Fatima Marnisi, um, she's not considered to be queer, or actually some people think of her as homophobic, right? So um, I'm using her text to think about other ways of thinking about queerness through alliances through time, as she talks about, you know, alliances between women through telling stories. And that is one way of thinking about undoing the Euro-American epistemological traditions because we don't need to come up with or follow the queer canon in the US. We can think about scholars, in particular feminist scholars, who have been writing in ways that may not be considered to be queer, but actually give us ways of thinking about queerness otherwise. And that is what I try to yeah. do. Yeah. 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 yeah, thanks. And I actually sort of just directly following up. Um, so in your work, you do make a case. I mean, your recent work, you make a case for a queer approach to geopolitics and the state specifically. And and you're asking the question whether failed states might be queer states. And so I was wondering if you could explain what you mean by that and and how does that concretely translate in, in your work? Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is again going back to the notion of queer state that I said, um, the article that I worked on. And um, again, thinking about queerness, I, often people, when they think about queer states, what comes to mind is states that have rights for queers, meaning rights for LGBTQAI, you know, the list of identities uh, that continues, of course, in the um, context of the states. Uh, often it is gays and lesbians and uh, trans people who are given certain rights, the right to join the military, the right to get married. And of course, within um, queer theory in the US, there have been some excellent critiques of that, you know, critiques of homonormativity, Lisa Dugan's work um, long time ago, but also more recent work on what does it mean to actually be complicit 
with forms of power, um, you know, with US uh, uh, military apparatus, you know, uh, what does it mean when gay marriage actually uh, ends up normalize, normalizing queers? What does it mean when it kind of privatizes healthcare and social services that should be actually universal, but rather than, uh, you know, through marriage, they become privatized. So, um, but the way that I'm thinking about queer states is not necessarily, and of course, there's also um, critique of state as straight. You know, you have Margot Kennedy's book, Straight State, I don't know, uh, uh, Edna Lupid and other people who have written about how the US state in particular is very much invested in heteronormativity. But the way I'm using queer states is actually thinking, as you said, through the notion of failed states. Because when people in political science, political theory think about failed states, they talk about states that fail to um, uh, provide services for their citizens or um, violate the human rights of their citizens or kind of um, fail to join the uh, international community in a sense. And I'm thinking about those within the context of geopolitics that why is that, for example, because my work is on Iran, um, how is it that sanctions actually is completely erased in thinking about why is that the Iranian state uh, cannot provide uh, certain services, right? What the, the restrictions uh, that are put uh, on Iran that don't necessarily affect, as you have written in your work, Nadia, don't affect the um, necessarily the elites or the state, but they actually kill people, right? They kill ordinary people, in particular, uh, the most marginalized people, including queer and trans people, working class queer and trans people, I should say. So I'm thinking about if, you know, if we think about failure as a queer art, as, you know, Jack Halberstam um, has written, um, then why not think about uh, failed states as queer states in a way that they're excluded from the so-called family of nations, right? So, and um, are, are subjected to disciplinary measures such as sanctions or war, you know, as it was in the case of Iraq. Um, and and um, that doesn't mean that those states, again, I'm not thinking through the lens of sexual identities. That doesn't mean that when I say queer states that they're queer friendly, but I'm thinking about queering as the way that the forms of exclusion that make populations killable, um, you know, uh, 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 constitutes queerness. So when I talk about queer states, I'm thinking about how queerness produces states, particular states, and how states uh, uh, produce particular forms of queerness that are then normalized. So that article kind of tries to rethink um, uh, the idea of uh, states. And this is not, again, it's not to give value to queer and say queer is good, straight is bad, right? So it's not to set up queer and straight as these binaries, but think about queerness as uh, through the lens um, that people, you know, like Jess Biogor and her work on homo nationalism has done um, to, to think about forms of, um, uh, you know, how certain, again, certain populations become available for death and injury and mm -hmm. are queered racially, as Poir would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, find this really, uh, you know, very interesting and sort of it, it links up, as you say, to you know, uh, some of the ideas that developed by Daspir Pua, Maya Mikdashi, and also when Hassan Musawi speaks about, you know, conflict and war becoming kind of the norm. I mean, he's also speaking about a failed state, but you really look at it specifically uh, in relation to Iran. I guess, you know, just sort of listening and, and thinking about it, I'm sort of wondering, but where the sort of the, the queerness or the queering is that then unidirectional? Is that the querying happening from the vantage point of the US or other, you know, the, the um, Western context? Or is it a kind of more transnational querying? You know, where, is, where lies the agency here? I, I'm just sort of trying to think it through as I'm listening to you. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, you know, it's a matter of uh, the U.S. querying yeah. 
say Iran or whatnot. It's, I think it's uh, the question of, um, again, process and mm. uh, geopolitics. How is that uh, in hegemonic forms of thinking about notions such as international community, right? Mm. Human rights, mm -hmm. uh, violation of human rights, then how already um, uh, so, sort of value is put and it becomes a consensus in the kind of international community in a sense that who is the violator of hu human rights and who is the protector of human rights, right? So it's mm -hmm. kind of not uh, necessarily, and, and of course, you know, the uh, Iranian state, as I say in my, uh, in the article that I also sent you, is, it's not to exonerate the Iranian state of its policies um, against, uh, queer people uh, or, you know, is basically interest in the biopolitical normalization of population. Um, but it is to think about how uh, within the context, again, thinking about geopolitics and the um, unequal uh, power. Uh, I mean, when we talk about states or international community or the United Nations, that's the assumption often is that states have the same kind of power and they're on the same kind of level of uh, power relationships and they can have negotiations, sit at the table. That's not the case. You know, we are uh, and moving beyond Iran. You know, we can think about colonial legacies, think about uh, foreign aid, you know, how foreign aid in Africa um, has become contingent on the records of LGBTQ rights, right? How Clinton said human right, gay rights are human rights and used that as a way to basically consider certain nation states as those who are violators and therefore kind of excluding them from um, uh, foreign aid and so on and so forth. So these are, and of course, um, as you know, uh, Raul Rao, for example, writes uh, in the case of Uganda, uh, these policies are not uh, helping queers in those locations. On the contrary, they open, um, and because of these economic policies, you know, they open room for um, all these, uh, you know, uh, Christian organizations and NGOs to basically um, come in, provide services, and actually reproduce homo uh, heteronormativity and homophobia in ways that um, are hurting queers um, in those locations. So um, it's not a matter, I mean, uh, you know, again, if you are thinking about agency, agency is not outside of power, right? Mm -hmm. So it is really, uh, I think my point is to think about complicities mm -hmm. and to think about the way that queerness mm -hmm has become uh, uh, one of the uh, measures or one of the kind of uh, whatever, uh, the criteria through which um, states are um, categorized from autocratic or theocratic to liberal uh, democratic. Um, so it is kind of to undo that normalization um, of, uh, and giving value to liberal democracy is the ideal forms of governance as opposed to say, you know, uh, theocracy and even using those terms, you know, mm -hmm. to think about states, so. Mm -hmm. more... Yeah, yeah, thanks for that clarification, Sima. So going specifically now to your book, The Politics of Rightful Killing, Civil Society, Gender and Sexuality in the Blogistan, in the book, you convincingly argue that the Iranian and also the Iranian diaspora's cyberspace is a manifestation of transnational civil society. And, and this is a space you, you say that is not only challenging state power and authoritarianism, but crucially also a site of governmentality and normalization. And can you start out by explaining what you actually, what the term that blogistan actually entails and, and reflect on the main arguments in your book that to my mind, you know, challenge prevailing ideas about both cyberspace and civil society. Um, so with blogistan um, basically, you know, like it's done in many other uh, states is kind of, it has a territorial connotation, right? The land of. So Weblogistan is the land of weblogs or blogs. 
Um, and it was a term that no one knows who coined, but it was used to uh, by bloggers, Iranian bloggers, uh, weblogist on to think about you know the uh, the community of bloggers, and um, so. Uh, when I talk about Weblogistan um, as a site of civil society, um, it is to point to the fact that yes, a lot of dialogue was uh, happening, particular in the height of, uh, you know, uh, blogging among Iranians in uh, mid 2000s, uh, among the particular group of uh, Iranians in Iran and outside of Iran. Um, and, uh, you know, be, because of this conversation, it was kind of a transnational uh, site of civil society. And often when, uh, and in many of these um, uh, uh, glorifying kind of accounts of web bloggers, I'm sorry, my cats are going crazy running around here. <laughs> um, and uh, many of these accounts you um, hear, uh, or uh, you would see that uh, web is uh, the site of civil society. The assumption was that uh, it is where so a civil society flourishes in Iran for the first time. So in a sense, it, uh, it kind of suffered, this account suffered from historical amnesia. It um, totally erased the long history of civil society in post-revolutionary in, uh, Iran, in particular after 1989, the end of the Iran-Iraq war in 88, you know, the, um, uh, the death of Ayatollah Khomeini and many other changes. Um, so a part of the book argues that no, it's not the um, site of civil society. Uh, it is exactly because of the pre-existing conversations and all the social movements and all these uh, kind of you know uh, the uh, the organizing that has been happening that are not also separate from the state. I talk about state not as this kind of monolithic. Um, top-down structure, but as very much, you know, fractured and um, also uh, having, uh, you know, those fractures uh, enabling the possibility of reform in Iran. So I talk about the reform uh, movement in Iran and how the, uh, the emergence of um, uh, Weblogistan is not separate from, uh, from uh, a pre-existing civil society, but also part of the way that people think about, and you know, part of the question of civil society is that rather than thinking about civil society as a site of consensus in the, in the Habermasian way, thinking about it as a site of conflict, where actually, as I discuss in the book, very violent conflicts happen in Weblogistan and in the discussions that happen, and um, uh, the gendered and um, uh, racial and ethnic exclusions through nationalist discourses that are repeated in uh, Weblogistan. Uh, so part of it is to say that, well, uh, yes, it is a transnational uh, site of civil society. And exactly because of that is a part of, uh, you know, is a site of conflict uh, and violence. Um, and then uh, rather than thinking about civil society in a top-down uh, relationship to the state, where often people think there is, here's the state, here's civil society, and then you have, you know, the citizens, um, rather than thinking about it as, um, uh, kind of an antagonistic or top-down relationship with the state uh, where state kind of has all the power to discipline its citizen. I think about civil society in a Foucauldian sense as a site of governmentality. That is, you know, state is not, um, or doesn't have monopoly over governance, but, you know, thinking about governmentality as just assemblage or nexus of uh, individuals, discourses, institutions, um, that of course, through biopower, as people would say, focus on the individual, but um, uh, aim to normalize the population at large. So I think about how civil society then um, becomes, and Weblogistan as a site of civil society, becomes a site where particular forms of Iranian subjectivities are normalized. Um, in this kind of uh, intersection of nationalist discourses and this kind of so-called uh, liberating uh, discourses of the US or you know, some European um, states that are interested in democratization uh, of Iran. So that is how kind of uh, notions of geopolitics and biopolitics come together. And then I also talk about how despite uh, the insistence of the U.S. on providing internet um, freedom to Iran, 
at the same time that the, the sanctions are imposed on the Iranian people. So that is where you know, necropolitics also comes into this kind of analysis to think about how the Iranian population becomes uh, uh, governable or you know, managed and at the same time becomes um, uh, in a, uh, disposable and subjected to a pending death through sanctions. Yeah, I want to get back to that issue. Um, just uh, as a reminder, so if you would like to put in your question or comments, please do that in the Q&A function. So as I was listening to you, I was actually, you know, the one time I uh, did manage to go to Iran. I mean, I hope that I will be able to go again at some point in the future, but I was invited in 2005, uh, at the height of the Khatami um, area, I was invited to speak at an event on civil society. And um, they had invited, um, it was actually uh, interestingly sort of co-sponsored by the Ministry of Interior <laughs> and civil society organizations. And they had invited people from all over the place, from Pakistan, from Russia, uh, you know, to speak about civil society organizations. And I, I, I was speaking about civil society organizations in, in Egypt feminist civil society organizations but you know what really struck me uh, what I found really amazing and particularly in comparison to the kinds of experiences I had while living in Egypt was um, you know the kind of confidence of some of the young especially women so there was one there was one panel where um, evidently someone from the ministry of interior was supposed to uh, chair the panel and uh, you know, a young woman stood up and said, "This is a this is a, a conference on civil society. Why are you chairing this panel?" And um, I was, I mean, this was sort of simultaneous translation, and you know, I was so shocked to then hear the guy say, "Okay, fine, I I go down and you come up here," and I found that really mind boggling. But I mean, it also tells you, of course, something about the. Um, you know, as, as, as you say, the kind of relationship between civil society and governmentality, which is not only more blurred in the context of the Middle East, but actually transnationally as well. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed, I mean, many things that I enjoyed the book is when you speak, when you sort of go and focus on the bloggers and, you know, you provide these really interesting accounts and, and um, sort of an in-depth really lends into, you know, the various discourses and narratives and reactions, it becomes clear that they're not homogeneous. Clearly, they're sort of very different. And in, you know, one area that becomes obvious is also sort of the area of sexuality, how people deal with sexuality. And, um, and you, you, you know, show how Islamic sexuality often tends to be conflated with tradition but you know at the same time we know it's also equated with hypersexuality as you also argue um so and then at the same time we know that modern and civilized is frequently being associated with heteronormativity and more recently homonormativity so it's very complex um so but you know it's not only the in the international media that there is this um, hyper visibility of the Iranian queer, um, but one of the many tensions and contradictions you highlight revolves around the way that bloggers actually tended to shift their narratives and discourses around gender and sexuality in the context of growing homonationalism during the war on terror. So what was happening there? Can you sort of explain to us what was going on? Sure, to make it really clear, we, we might be running out of time um, uh, so that there's time for Q&A. Um, this is where, you know, actually you were one of the first, maybe the first uh, person um, who invited me to talk about uh, the entrepreneurship, neoliberal entrepreneurship, uh, I remember in Feminist Review, <laughs> which ran, um, that article that I wrote from uh, a chapter um, of the, uh, at that point, dissertation. Um, appeared. And um, so basically what was happening was that um, in um, at that time, exactly because of the uh, geopolitical interests of the US, there was a lot of funding um, for uh, kind of, you know, investment in 
uh, propaganda and you know democratization projects and internet was an apt site to do that so um a lot of uh, uh not all bloggers of course some of the bloggers who were very much interested um in kind of making a living uh, in particular these are uh, bloggers outside of iran in europe uh, or north america in canada and the us of course uh, we're tapping into these opportunities and of course like i said before because you know being lgbt friendly uh has become the yardstick of progress and civilization and you know um uh democracy uh, democracy um uh, people who were perhaps very homophobic, and I discussed some of these accounts, um, uh, or you know, very uh, very much invested in uh, the heteronormative nation, all of a sudden became advocates of gay and lesbian rights, of course, of a sanitized type, right? So it was very interesting to see how these discussions emerged and how there was this uh, kind of all of a sudden interest everyone and their brothers had become, uh, you know, a gay rights advocate and queer friendly. Um, so that those discussions were really a, a part of what was happening, again, you know, in uh, the context of the so-called war on terror and democratization um, projects in Iran and how queerness uh, became a, she, a kind of a chic subject to talk about. But as I discuss in the book, it is a particular kind of, um, you know, as bloggers called it, homosexuality um, that um, was tolerated. So it was discourses of tolerance, neoliberal discourses of tolerance that were deployed to say, you know, if you're thinking about the future of Iran, and of course we were practicing democracy in the blog is for a democratic future. If we are practicing democracy, then we should tolerate homosexuals, but of course is very, very much normal, uh, you know, the kind of homonormative notions of sexuality where it would be uh, a particular um, kind of, you know, again, uh, those who are normal, um, uh, they get married, they're good citizens and so on and so forth. So that is really what was happening. It was kind of in the context of neoliberal entrepreneurship, I discussed that these particular bloggers um, became very much interested in these discussions around queerness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to now uh, turn to a question from Maris Kelada. Hello, Maris. So Maris is uh, saying, thank you for this very engaging conversation. I would like you to elaborate more on how you conceive of subjectivity in relation to geopolitics and queerness. How do you set up an analysis that does not frame subjectivity as a passive outcome of these matter powers, be it the state or identity? Well, thank you for that question. Um, so I think about uh, subjectivity uh, in a sense um, through uh, this lens of um, particular subject positions that uh, become available and then, you know, um, of course, uh, this is not a passive project, a passive process, because uh, as I discuss in uh, the book, particular, uh, you know, bloggers tap, knowingly tap into these opportunities. So it's not uh, about the question of passiv uh, passivity, it's about how one becomes a subject um, and that project, of course, is not outside of power. So when we are thinking about agency, and I assume you know uh, you're pointing more towards the question of agency when you talk about passivity, um, that um, it is the uh, yeah, when we are thinking about in a post-structuralist way, of course, thinking about uh, notions of agency. Agency is not coming outside of power, but you know it is also enabled um by uh dominant forms of power but it's not necessarily you know subverting them it is of course shifting those uh dominant or, or hegemonic forms of power uh while being complicit so my point here is to actually highlight uh 
complicities as well as uh, forms of dissent. So it's neither to say that bloggers are passive victims of um, you know, geopolitical interests of the US, um, nor to say that there are you know, uh, uh, dissidents. It is to think about how, yes, there are forms of dissent that happen in a site like Weblogistan in, in you know, so when I say site, not in the terms of website, but as as um, kind of where um, these uh, conversations happen. So it's both uh, a site of um, dissent, both perhaps to the Iranian state and to global capitalism, but also uh, a site of complicity. And I write about how some bloggers, I mean, you know, the dominant forms of thinking about web bloggers and only highlight um, the dissent to the Iranian state, uh, not paying attention to the fact that actually the Iranian state also used blogs, right? So, and also there were bloggers who were very much uh, loyal uh, to the Iranian um, state, for example. So um, to, rather than kind of this uh, binary of agency and passivity, I think my point is to think about how power works in very complex ways and how uh, bloggers are uh, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, agents of democratization or um, passive victims of global capitalism, but they basically participate uh, in reproducing also um, these um, kind of hegemonic discourses, whether it's nationalism or you know uh, uh, liberation um, uh, discourses of the U.S. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, sort of following up on that, Sima. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about parallels between parallels and also differences in terms of Iran and Iraq. Mm -hmm. In, not only in terms of the impact of the war on terror, um, but also the very complex political positionings vis-a-vis -vis US imperialist policies and authoritarian government. Um, I was always struck um, how polarized some of these debates are, I mean, and have been, and they were also in the Iraqi diaspora, but somehow I feel they're even more polarized in the Iranian diaspora. Um, now, how has this tension been playing out in the context of the ongoing sanctions and the threat of war? And how has that changed as well? Because to my mind, what I see is that in the earlier years, and I, you know, I was sometimes invited to speak at events organized by <clears throat> Iranian women, and you know, they were sort of interested precisely in the parallels with the Iraqi situation, you know, where you had sanctions, where you had an authoritarian government, where they had the threat of war. <clears throat> and while I found that sort of initially it was sort of extremely polarized, but now there are more these positions that you're describing where people are not refusing to be either this or that and have sort of more sort of, I guess, complex positions, but they're also, I guess contextuals that you're sometimes pushed in certain situations to you know stress one or the other and i'm sort of wondering how uh in your mind this has been playing out and how you have been possibly shifting or not at all um you're absolutely right i mean there are so many lessons to be learned from iraq and this is unfortunate to say because iraq has paid a really hefty price for this right um with millions uh, dead and um basically the situation that we are facing uh that people of iraq are facing um and i think you know one can argue that uh even though the two are not the same and people often say Iran is not Iraq, uh, but there are so many similarities that one can see the strategies, how the sanctions basically over time pushed Iraqi people to the point of basically uh, not being able to even um, live, right? So um, I, I say that in, um, 
something that I recently wrote from my own niece, who's a doctor, who basically during the sanctions with the COVID situation says, you know, at this, I mean, she was someone who was adamantly against US intervention. And she says, you know, whatever the, uh, we are already dying. So it doesn't matter even if the US attacks, right? So this is something that exactly the sanctions do. And that is the point of the sanctions to increase discontent to the point and to, of course, um, uh, you know, intensify the authoritarianism um, of the state to the point that people basically, um, it doesn't matter if it's bombs or, you know, if it's basically dying from um, hunger or la lack of access to clean water or clean air or medicine. Um, so there are, I think, many similarities and Zainab Saleh's book, recent book, um, Return uh, to Ruin is um, discussing also that and also the politics of diaspora, which, you know, as you can, uh, if you have read the book, there are a lot of similarities also uh, with this kind of contentious politics of the diaspora. And, you know, uh, if Iraq had Chalabi's, uh, Iran has many uh, similar uh, figures in the US that are very willing to uh, participate in a kind of a military attack and regime change. Uh, and they're supporting the sanctions, uh, you know, and some of them uh, claim to be feminists or representative uh, of Iranian feminists, such as Masih Haley Nejad, right? Uh, and, you know, having kind of very close relationships with uh, Trump and Pompeo under um, Trump administration. So these kinds of um, politics, the way that they, I think, um, uh, play out is this kind of polarization where people become, uh, you know, there, there, there is this form of uh, situation where even activists in Iran who were before very much against the sanctions and were producing videos, feminist activists, I'm sure you have seen those videos of talking about why they're against wars, uh, against the war in Iran. Uh, they're hesitant of doing that because the situation is, is so dire at this point um, in Iran. And I think um, the way that I have tried to participate in uh, these kinds of, um, you know, politics in a sense, diasporic politics is help co-found the coalition No Sanctions on Iran and, um, you know, uh, have different scholars and uh, people talk about why sanctions hurt ordinary people and not the state and how they, you know, uh, hurt trans people, how they uh, hurt queer people, how they hurt uh, Iranian women's movement and so on and so forth. So I'm going a little bit tangent, but I just wanted to- Yeah, yeah. No, it's an important point. So I'm going back to audience questions and my um, colleague, uh, Adi Ophir. Hello, Adi. Um, so um, he's saying, thank you for a fascinating talk. You related very interestingly weak state and state's failure with the possible queerness of and the state. Even the recent failure of the US federal administration to declare an emergency when a catastrophic epidemic is taking place and to monopolize the use of violence, would it be useful or accurate to queer the US? Um, and sorry for my US centric question. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for your question. And yes, um, you know, there is um, definitely uh, the failure of the US, but this is, you know, the US in terms of its failures, it's not new. It's not just the epidemic, you know, with Katrina, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, with many, many um, incidents where the US actually has failed to protect, uh, in particular, its racialized citizens, right? So it's nothing new. But then when it comes to, I'm talking about the kind of, uh, um, uh, the way that the notion of failed state is deployed, right, or weak state. We never think about the U.S. as a weak state or a failed state. Um, we never think about the state as a violator of human rights or queer and trans rights, whereas, you know, there are so many queer and trans, in particular queer and trans people of color who are uh, being killed. Um, 
you know, the, the definition of basically refugee, um, when, when you think about the uh, refugee regimes, um, one of the definitions is when the state fails to protect its citizens um, against violence. And the US uh, certainly has historically failed not only to protect, but also subjected um, racialized populations to violence um, and, uh, but then when it comes to refugee regimes, we never, I mean, it's very unlikely that the UNHCR would accept or uh, grant refugee status to a trans woman of color from the US, as I have argued this before. So um, I, when I say failed state or weak state is not, I mean, uh, it's not to take those um, ter terminologies uh, as the truth, but is to kind of question their deployment in the way that in um, uh, the designation of states into those that are, uh, again, liberal democratic and those that are uh, weak states, authoritarian, you know, uh, theocratic and so on and so forth. So there is definitely room to, I mean, there should be a questioning of those terms in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what I'm trying to convey here is the way that we uh, these these terms are deployed, not you know to take them as face value. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I um, I would like to ask one last question. I mean, you've addressed it already in some ways, but maybe if more explicitly also in light of your uh, forthcoming work, if you can sort of provide us. Um, with some working definition of this idea of loaned life and I guess also link that to the title of your book the published book the politics of rightful killing sure. thank you and I'll try to make it quick for people who have to leave so um you know politics of rightful killing really um is pointing to a form of politics uh and I draw from the work that is done in the realm of biopolitics borrowing from Foucault's notion of biopolitics, which is um, to uh, uh, make live and let die, right? So we are, uh, and of course, Foucault is thinking in the context of um, Europe and the US uh, and not, uh, you know, quite concerned um, uh, with uh, the, the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, so we are thinking about populations whose lives are worth uh, protecting uh, and cultivating. So biopolitics is about cultivating life, right? A good life. Um, and then on the other side, you have people who have kind of complicated Foucault's notion of biopolitics. Um, Shil Mbembe, uh, for example, uh, or you know, Agamben uh, in different ways, thinking about, um, you know, uh, in Mbembe's words, necropolitics, basically populations that are made killable, right, or are let to die. And the examples that Mbembe um, brings are, for example, slaves in plantations, or uh, you know, Palestinians, or you know, uh, Agamben's uh, example of Muslims in um, the uh, uh, the Nazi camps. Um, so, uh, what I'm saying is that, well. You know, even though biopolitics, of course, when Foucault writes about biopolitics, um, he does say that the cultivation of the life of one is at the expense of the diminishment uh, of the other. And that for him is the definition of racism. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we have populations who are in uh, uh, Agamben's uh, words are reduced to bare life. Basically, they're, they're stripped of rights, right? So um, there is where kind of Mbembe defines uh, necropolitics. And what I'm saying is that, well, it isn't always this kind of binary that you have populations such as people of Iraq, such as people of Iran, um, who become apt for democratization, right? So they're subjected to kind of biopolitical practices and the context of what I discuss uh, in Iran is, you know, how um, uh, the defense of the Iranian people's lives becomes um, the obsession of many U.S. politicians uh, that the Iranian people, uh, people's heritage, and so on and so forth, are kind of invoked to say that the Iranian people um, 
you know, uh, are uh, uh, those who can uh, live a democratic life. So they, they kind of are seen as apt for democratization, but at the same time, they're subjected to a pending death through sanctions. So it's kind of a form of, uh, you know, not perhaps slow death as Lauren Berland would say, but mm -hmm. a soft form of killing, right? So it's kind of killing softly, as I say, through sanctions. And that is where I talk about um, politics of rightful killing. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of politics that um, uh, sanctions death in mm -hmm. the name of rights. So it's not uh, stripping one of rights, but imbuing uh, a population with rights, but exactly because of the so-called protection of those rights, making that um, that popul uh, population is killable. And the notion of loaned life then comes in, in this context where um, rather than bear life being stripped of life, mm -hmm. uh, I argue that Iranian um, people live a loaned life, that their life uh, becomes kind of like, uh, you know, uh, alone. And then, you know, I, I need to think about this even more in the context of global capitalism yeah. and you know, um, finance and all that. But uh, just in the context of how uh, Iranians, uh, you know, are given this life mm -hmm. right? um, that can uh, be taken away at any time if, um, you know, they don't basically, because, uh, exactly because uh, they carry a risk, the yeah. risk of terrorism yeah. that kind of uh, is attached to their bodies as uh, Iranians who are uh, perceived as being terrorists. So this kind of sanction, uh, sanctions on the Iranian people um, are creating this condition when um, the, the life of Iranian, and that could be taken away through sanctions or, you know, kind of in um, the shock and awe way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm really sorry, Sima. I mean, I could uh, continue this uh, super fascinating and important conversation for a long time, but we've run out of we have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, thanks so much uh, for joining us, Sima. Uh, thank you, um, the audience, for joining us. Uh, we uh, have recorded this event, so we'll make it available. And um, yeah, hope to see you um, the next semester when we continue this series. Thank you, Sima. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.